Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Moses from the Chemical Engineering Department. I've been using clickers for the past two years. Um, for me, probably the motivation for me was based on the courses that I normally teach, which is mathematics and physics. But I apply this on a physics course. I will tell you why probably you'll be seeing this in physics. What is the relationship between the two? <laughs> Because I kind of felt that my students, the way they've learned from high school, you know, how they learn is what we call the root learning or they have receipt, how to pass the exam. They follow a receipt, how to write, pass an like you've got a question paper, you write everything you follow, you get an answer, but you don't even engage why the question is that. Then I kind of look at how they study as the same way as if like, if I asked you for the first time to go and bake a scone, you've never baked a scone before. I can give you the receipt, can go and buy all the ingredients, everything, and then you can go and mix the two eggs, everything, and then after some time, you can get your, your, your score. And the question if I ask you, do you know how to bake? You will say probably yes, I know how to bake because you've managed to get a nice, beautiful score. And I realized that this is the same way as my students when they come. They pass physics, they, some of them distinction, but if I ask the question, how do you, what's happening there? They cannot give you a response. They just know that, you know, I just follow that process and they get an answer. And then I started realizing maybe I must find a way of getting my student to engage, to really, you know, to have these two ideas that they might have that can be maybe one student sitting down on the other side and the other one sitting there with conflicting ideas. How do I allow these ideas to kind of collide and something comes up and the motivation becomes for me to introduce things like clickers to bring the discussion. Just to avoid this idea of just following the recipe learning. Probably you've also maybe observed this recipe learning when you're driving. Probably you've been frustrated maybe when you're driving sometime. Someone decided to slow down. And when they reach a corner, they decided to just put an indicator they turn. And if you ask yourself, why did this person slow down and then indicate? The person maybe doesn't have an idea what is the purpose of an indicator. They just know that when you have to find a left turn, you indicate and turn. And this is the same way that the student learn. They just know that they must just press an indicator. And turn, but they don't know that the purpose is to warn the person that is behind that I'm going to what, to make a turn ahead. And this is how a student learn from high school. Then this was probably the purpose for that. Then I had a framework that I normally adopted for my teaching and learning, which probably most of people have seen me presenting. I've spoke much about this framework, which I'm going to show you how I integrate the clickers on this framework. This framework was uh, developed by Lori Lind, which on this side, she's what we call the instructor side, as you can see. And on this side, you've got the learner. The first thing, as we normally do as lectures, we go and introduce the concept. We teach, and there's this dialogue that happened between us and our student. Normally, this dialogue happens with the active student, the so-called the active student. I think a few years ago when I started teaching, I got accused of having favorite students. Because every time when I teach someone, there's always one student who's always asked me, and it feels like you're giving the student that attention. Then I kind of remember I was kind of angry when I got, when I read the student comment that, you know, he's the latest the favorite student. And I wanted to find a way, how can I improve this dialogue that is happening here on the discursive side? Then the idea was to bring the clickers on this idea to support the discussion. Instead of me having a dialogue with my active student, I can have the dialogue with all the students. Then I decided to frame my discussion in two, in two ways. One was either I would ask my student to read day before they come to class. Then I pose a question, but this question must not be must be more like conceptual question that it must not have an answer directly. It must be something that they need to really think. And by doing so, the question ends up spiking the discussion among the learners. At the end, before I start my lecture, the discussion would have happened. The student would be having different options, different opinions. And then we could able to poll them and see where they are. And at the moment, you don't give a response as a lecture to the to the student. And then another option was either I will give my lecture on this discursive mode, and then I adopt uh, my lectures into asking questions. I, I have a task goal where I can ask questions after on this side, where I can set up goals, where I ask questions, and I expect the student to be able to perform the action where they will answer the question, and then. The feedback that they get, it doesn't come from me, it comes from themselves. Then this is going to be the after. The discussion I could do before, and this could be also the after. But what was also important for me was also the issue of saying, how do I get 
my student to be able to reflect from what happens on the lecture and also on the homework that they've been given. And on this case, also I also wanted myself as a lecturer to be able to look at the reflection of my student performance. What I've given a lecture or I've had a discussion with the student or they discussed themselves, how do I reflect on the content itself to kind of bridge the two? Then this was one of the things which was beneficial. The beneficial was the reflection of the student and also me as a lecturer to be able to reflect. Then I will show, I don't want to discuss the whole thing, I just gonna I will show some of the picture that I had. I will pose a question which more or less like this question. On this case was a physics class where there were two, a person was standing on top of the cliff. There was two options of throwing a stone. You throw a stone down at a certain angle or you throw it up at a certain angle. In the absence of uh, air resistance, the question that I asked the student that will the stone, which is like this stone here, will it reach the ground with a higher velocity than the stone that was first go up and come down? And on this question, there's not really an answer of yes or no. The student would have to look at the picture and try to imagine. And in most of the cases, you would expect that most of the student will think because this stone will reach on the ground faster, they will think that it will have the what? It will reach with a higher velocity. Then you will tend to see that most of the students will make different choices. On my case, I was quite surprised on this case where my student, majority of the student, quite got it right. So on a question like this, on a case one like this, you may not have a lot of debate because you can see that majority of the students here, they managed to click on the right answer on this case. Then on this case, case one, you don't get much of a debate on this case. Then the case two, which was interesting, was when I asked the student that in the absence of air resistance, if you should, if you drive a car at a constant velocity, you shoot a bullet up, will the bullet end up behind you or will be ahead of you or will end up on the, on the barrel itself? So on this question, a lot of students kind of picture the, the, the normal scenario where there's air resistance, which you expect that the bullet will fall probably if there's air resistance the blood will fall kind of behind because the air resistance will kind of reduce the velocity. The majority of the students, as you can see from here, there was a lot of who chose number A, which was behind you, and also the other one who chose uh, number C, which was probably the right answer in this case. But on this case, you can see that the graphs were very close to each other. On this case, that is when the debate happened. Then on this case, as a lecture, you don't give uh, the answer you allow the student to be able to talk to each other, to convince each other, where we end up with what we call peer instruction, where the student end up trying to convince each other, why did you choose number A instead of choosing number B? And on this case, you tend to find this discussion that will tend to happen among the students themselves. And then after that, you can open the poll. If you open the poll and nothing changes, then you can have two camps now. You can have the student who don't want to move from their stand, original standpoint, and the other students who are remaining on the standpoint to have a representative of those two groups. As you can see, the two students, this was after the second where the student didn't want to move to the standpoint because they felt that it didn't make sense why the bullet will go back to the rifle back. And it becomes more of like, you know, even if they talk, they couldn't change their mind. Then you started to hear, especially now from the two students now, from two camp representing their camp, why they think their answer is that. And then now you can see this debate. If there's no answer, that is when you as a lecturer, as a facilitator, towards the end, you can try to give the clarity, which brings you back to that point of reflection that I've talked about me as a lecturer. Then you can realize that maybe the concept that you've taught, probably the students didn't even, were not able to get the concept. You can go back and retort the course concept based on that. Then you as a lecturer, for me on this case, I have to reflect on my teaching, or maybe the way I introduced that concept, probably the student didn't get it. Then that's when you tend to see. Then at the end, the feedback, you tend to get you where your students are at that moment, which is much better on this case. And then this is probably where I will end.